YouTube friends, I'm Sherry of Storied Gifts, and today I'm asking the burning question that I'm asking myself as well, why do you work? Now the most obvious reason that you work is to earn income, and you earn the income to pay for the other things and other services and aspects of your life that you want to fund. As early as the industrial age, or because of the industrial age, tycoons created organizations with the idea that people would basically work for money. And so they didn't care about working conditions or anything like that, and people were slaving away in factories and whatnot because they would show up because they needed income. But as time has gone on and people find themselves in jobs they do not like, people have changed jobs or changed careers because they hope to do better and to have a job that balances with their life better. So before I go any further, I want to mention again that this is Sherry of the Story Gifts channel and all of the content I plan to create here, especially for this next year, is meant to enrich your life story. So please subscribe and become part of my very elite group of followers and be on board and let's have a conversation about topics that will matter to you and your life story. But today the subject again is why do you work? So the industrial age really changed the model of how people work. They didn't work on the land any, for, any longer, but we're working in factories. But as we know, especially from the latest uh, period of the pandemic, people are leaving jobs and walking away from working traditional jobs to find other ways of fulfilling their lives through work. Did you know that one third of your life at least is spent working? And if you care for yourself and other people like your family, you probably work a lot more that you don't technically get paid for. So earning income really is important, but as you get to going in your life and time becomes more limited, especially as you age, you'll step back. And now younger people are doing it. Step back and you may have may be seeking other things that you expect to find fulfilling in your work. People like to be social. People like to work on teams. People like to feel that the work they're doing is serving a purpose. And I'd say that people like to feel that the work they're doing actually utilizes services and or talents and skill sets that they have and that they feel are their best skills and talents. So today I'm going to explore the story of Nellie Bly. She was the first female investigative journalist and she, has a, she became a journalist in the late 1800s at a time when women, it was the Victorian era, and women had no choices other than to be housekeepers or nannies or that sort of thing. And she actually decided to become a journalist because she felt it was something she was good at and also because she was a, wanted to earn an income and stay, remain independent. So today I'll be telling you about Nellie Bly. Nellie was born Elizabeth Jane Cochran on May 5, 1864, a year before the Civil War ended, in Cochran's Mill, Pennsylvania. Her father was Judge Michael Cochran and served as the judge for Armstrong County. He was prominent, self-made, and had a lot of power and money. He married Mary Jane, which was his second marriage after his first wife, Catherine Murphy, had died. He brought 10 children to the marriage, and then he and Mary Jane had five more children, including Nellie. When Nellie was five, the family moved into a beautiful two and a half story mansion. By this time, the older 10 children had all grown up and moved on. So it was Nellie and her other siblings with Mary Jane in the home. Unfortunately, only a year later, Michael died, but he did not leave a will. One of the older siblings petitioned to have all the property sold, thus leaving Mary Jane to raise her children and live on only $16 a month. The next year, Nellie's family moved into a much smaller home, and Mary Jane entered into a second marriage. The second husband turned out to be an abusive alcoholic. 
This was the Victorian era, so women had no power, and obtaining a divorce required a great deal of persistence and some luck. It would take several years for Mary Jane to be freed from the marriage. During that time, Nellie's education was spotty. The most profound thing Nellie learned was that women had no rights and no access to options. She found that more than anything else, she wanted to have control over the course of her life and not be obliged to marry. She wanted to earn her own way. The options were few. Nellie could become a teacher, a housekeeper, or nanny. Nellie tried to earn a teaching certificate by attending college in Indiana, but there turned out to be no money for her education, so she had to stop after one term. Nellie's family moved to Pittsburgh, and she regularly read the daily newspaper, The Pittsburgh Dispatch. She especially followed the articles written by Quiet Observer, which she later learned were penned by Erasmus Wilson. He wrote a series of articles expressing his opinions regarding the limitations of women, stating they were best suited to domesticity and that women working outside the home was a monstrosity. Nellie's ire was spurred by QO's comments, especially the one in which he said, in China, they sell girl babies because they can make no good out of them. Who knows, but this country might have to resort to this at some time. Nellie wrote a letter to the editor under the pseudonym Orphaned Girl. She explained to QO that women had no options to survive and could hardly flit about like butterflies tending to housekeeping duties. Nellie's letter was filled with poor spelling and grammar, but the fire of her message was there. Ultimately, the managing editor of the Pittsburgh Dispatch, George Maiden, solicited via an ad for the author of the letter to come in and offered her a job. Nellie was thrilled and realized her passion for writing and research would be the driving force for her work going forward. Nellie knew inherently that she had to believe in herself because nobody else would and George Maiden decided on her pen name of Nellie Bly based on a popular song of the day. Nellie was a woman of strong beliefs. She never shied away from expressing them. In fact, the primary reason she researched and wrote articles was to help others. She wrote a series of articles about the conditions of women working in factories, their low pay, the poor working environment, and their lack of hope. Her letters particularly displeased the Christian ladies of the community. Nellie's response was, One girl saved, given a lift on life's rough road, is more creditable than a lifetime spent in prayer. Nellie could never square how anyone ignored social injustice. Soon after, Nellie's column was canceled. The managing editor relegated Nellie to the ladies' pages of the newspaper, where she was expected to cover stories about gardening and housekeeping. Nellie couldn't think of anything more boring to write about than those topics, so she frequently pitched new story ideas. Within nine months, she was able to secure a new project and headed to Mexico, traveling with her mother as a chaperone. They didn't care for the food and didn't know Spanish, but in short time, Nellie was sending dispatches back to the paper about the culture, such as bullfights, the daily life of the people, the politics, and especially about the mistreatment of journalists. Mexico was run by a dictator in those days, so soon after her articles hit the paper in Pittsburgh, Nellie was forced to leave the country. But Nellie continued to report based on her research for a time when she returned home, and then once again she was relegated to the ladies' section. Nellie harnessed the injustice of the situation and hunkered down even harder. She was convinced with her experience that she could land a better job. Nellie was particularly interested in working for Joseph Pulitzer of the New York World. Nellie proved that persistence and setbacks may eventually land on luck. She finagled an interview with the managing editor John Cockrell and pitched several story ideas. It was enough for him to sign her on with the paper, but it would be a bit before he came up with his assignment. The first project Cockrell offered was for Nellie to stay at a boarding house, pretend to be insane, and ultimately get herself committed into Blackwell's Island Insane Asylum. Once there, she was to research and interview inmates about the conditions. Cockrell promised they'd have her released from the asylum, although he didn't say how that would happen. Her reports became the renowned book, 
10 days in a madhouse. The book launched Nellie's career and significant changes were made in how the mentally ill were cared for as well. Nellie went on to write several books, travel the world in under 80 days, operate a business, and work as a major social activist as well. The takeaways from Nellie's work-life story? Number one, find the passion for whatever you're doing and let that guide you and ultimately aim for what you want to do. Number two, be your advocate. If you're not advocating for you, how can you ask others to believe in you? Number three, keep trying. Success comes for those who persist from one failure to another. It's easy to feel hopeless, so that's when you need to double down and take action. Number four, measure your improvement with your yardstick. The only person to be better than is the person you were the day before. Number five, keep your mind open to what your success may look like. The adventure comes in sometimes going with what you least expected. You are on an exciting journey and your work is one way you leave a legacy. Strive to be interested and you'll be interesting. So if you've made it through listening about Nellie Bly, I hope you found her story inspiring to help you do the kind of work that you feel is serving you as well as serving others. Tell me what you do. Tell me what you'd like to do as work for work. And let's figure out why we work together. Thanks and subscribe.